So today I, I asked her, may I call you a friend? I hope so. All right. <laughs> uh, Brother Andy was someone who, he, he doesn't know this, but uh, I've been kind of following his movement for a little bit now. And uh, I love his heart for God. And through his, through his works and, and through his ministry, I'm sure people can see it because I'm not significant. But through his works and the things that I have seen him do, which is not much, I see his love for God's people. And I'm drawn to him, per se, uh, wanting to have a passion for God and his people the way that he does. Same thing with many other people who I've been blessed to encounter in my life. So I, I, I contacted him and I said, would you just come one weekend and share? Just share. What do you want me to share? I want you to share whatever God impresses upon you, whatever is on your heart. So I, I would love for everyone here and, and everyone at home who is watching to please give a warm welcome to my friend and our brother, Mr. Andrew White. Well, praise God. I'm going to move some of this out of the way here. Let me get set up here a little, little bit. All righty. I want to thank Pastor Art for, for the in, in, invitation. I do, as Sister Nikki yeah. did say a moment ago, I got to follow him now? <laughs> really? Really? I, it was a setup. <laughs> He fired me up, <laughs> and he made me cry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Praise God. As I'm getting ready here, let me, let me get this here. All right. As I'm getting ready here, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Esther. As we come into a, a new year, of course, the name of the title of this message, which comes out of the book of Esther, is for such a time as this. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I pray for your anointing on this word. I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that you would open up our ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to each individual, both in this sanctuary this morning and those who would be watching by way of wherever they're watching from, Facebook, YouTube, wherever this is streaming out. I'm speaking to the body of Christ, those who are in this room and those who are outside of this room. And I pray, Lord, wherever your spirit is, is there meeting with them, Lord, that you would, Lord, cause this word to prosper. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story of Esther, and if not, I want to encourage you, really this week, to, to read it, go home and read the whole book. Obviously, it would be impossible for me to go through the whole book of Esther in, in, in a brief you know, message, and the, the emphasis is, will not be on the word brief. <laughs> My wife will sit there, and you know, she'll, she'll give me the clock there, but I, 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 I do... I'm going to bring this word in an unusual way, in a truncated way, so to speak, because of so many things I do want to get to, but again, not being able to, to uh, go through the whole book. But So what I'm going to begin to do, and I want you to really zero in on this, is I'm going to give you a list of the characters, a list of, of as, as though this was a, a drama, so to speak. This is a real historical accounting of something that happened, and I want to draw out of it as it applies to our lives in 2022 for such a time as this. Because in the book of Esther, there are many types and many analogies that can be gleaned from the book of Esther. The book of Esther is, is really a book of a political intrigue, of cultural and legal issues, a book that shows 
uh, it shows how God places his church and his people in places of government and political influence. Hello? In places of political and government influence. Why? To influence the powers that be. Because this is what we're called to do as salt of the earth and light of the world. Amen? Amen. To influence and affect change and even bring about deliverance. Esther herself, by way of type and shadow. You know about types and shadows? Esther herself is a type of the church. The king, of course, King Ahasuerus, is a, is, is, he, some say he's a type of God the Father. Some say he's a type of Jesus. For my purposes in the sermon, he's a type of simple government authority. Hello. Uncle Mordecai, everybody familiar with Uncle Mordecai? Mordecai is a type of a, a watchman prophet who warns Esther, the church, of things to come through the schemes of Haman. And of course, Haman is a type of Satan, an enemy of the people of God, an accuser of the brethren. Haman in the natural was a political opportunist. He was an elitist concerned only with his own position and prestige and power. Now I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, but for the sake of context, I'm going to read the whole chapter of Esther chapter 4. You there? When Mordecai learned all that had happened, now let me get you up to that point to set the stage. Haman went to the king and said there was a people in his land that weren't following the rules, that weren't following the laws of the of the land. They were a different people. They had a they had different laws and a different culture. Just like not Mordecai, Haman had gone to set up the annihilation of the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. So chapter 4, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hatak, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was, what's going on? So Hadak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go to the king to make supplication to him and plead for him before her people. So Hatak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in the Shushan, that was the capital of the Persian Empire, or one of them anyway, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night and day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And I will go to the king, which is against the law. Which is against the law. 
Sometimes you got to break the law to get things done the right way. Hello. How many of you know that God's laws supersede man's laws? But I'll get to that in a moment. I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I was a little hesitant, as I said a moment ago, to use a cliche of a title for such a time as this. I was a little hesitant to use this title. But being that we are at the beginning of a, of a new year, and in light of the message I want to bring forth, it's some, it really just seemed apropos, even though it's a little bit of a cliche. But today, I want to encourage your hearts. That's what I want to do today. I want to encourage your hearts. And I want to do it on several different levels because God has a purpose and a destiny for each and every one here. God has a purpose and a destiny for each and every one here. And if you're still breathing right now in 2022, as hard as it might be with some of those masks on, but if you're still breathing and if you're still alive, I'm going to put another cliche on, on top. I'm going to add cliche on top of a cliche. Your, your, your reason for the season isn't over. You know, we just went through Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. Another cliche. But if you're here right now, you were here for such a time as this, and the reason for your season isn't finished yet. Amen. Amen. God has a purpose. God has a destiny. And some folks like to ignore the situations going on around them. They don't want to get involved. What, 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 did, what, did, what, did, what did Esther say? Well, it's against the law, and uh, I don't know what's going on. And But one guy says, well, go ahead. If you want to go hide, go hide. But God's going to have his way if he's got to do it through somebody else. Some people think they could just, you know, they, they don't have to get involved. They think it's safer to just remain in their comfort zone. Don't rock the boat is the guidepost of their life. But I'll, I'll say it again. Mordecai said, do not think in your heart you'll escape. See, my word of exhortation to you today really is a challenge. I want to challenge you. I want to exhort you. I want to call you to action. Don't think you can just play it safe, church. Don't think with all that's going out there in the world is going to somehow go around you simply because I don't want to get involved. That's not what God's called his people to be. That's not what God's called his people to do. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, in the last days, difficult times will come. And I want to tell you without hesitation, I want to tell you without any reservations, that the time is upon us now. The time that Paul talked about in Timothy, those times are upon us now. In the last days, perilous times will come. But God has called us. For what? Hello? We are living in difficult times, perilous times. We are living in the end times. The Bible has a lot to say about the end times. God has a prophetic blueprint in all of history. All of history is rushing forward to that end game. And something I often say is that the geopolitical maneuverings and machinations of men and of nations are nothing less than the prophetic determinations of the living God. Want me to say that again? <laughs> Somebody's writing it down. The geopolitical maneuverings and machinations of men and of angels, of angels, sorry, nations, although angels too, prince powers, principalities, and fallen angels. I won't go down that road. <laughs> but they're nothing more or less than the prophetic determinations of the living God. What are you saying? Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Because I want to give you a couple of principles of where I'm going with this. Daniel chapter 2. Verses 19 through 21. I want to show you something here. Because we are living in difficult times. Amen? I want to tell you something. The times that Esther was living in were difficult times. Daniel, verse, uh, Daniel 2, verse... Yeah, I'm going to pick up in... Uh, I'm going to pick up in verse 20. 
Daniel answered the king. This would be Nebuchadnezzar at that point in time. Another watchman prophet of God who was in a place of influence. Speaking of being in places of influence. I'm saying that for a reason. I'll get to that later. But Daniel said, blessed be the name of God forever and forever. For wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises kings up. The geopolitical situations of men and of nations are nothing but the predetermined plans of God. Hello. He removes kings and he raises them up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Turn with me to, uh, to Daniel chapter 11, because I'm going to build on this top, this theme right now. 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 32. It's one of my life verses. Daniel 11, 32. I'm actually just going to pick up in the in the middle of the of the verse of Daniel 11:32 because it, it, it's it's really a life verse for me but it says here um in verse the middle of verse 32 the people that know their god shall be strong you see that the people who know their god shall be strong and carry out great exploits now the context of this verse is in the is in the last days the context of this verse is is is, is during the time of the great tribulation which i won't get into right now but i, I want to bring some some ideas together here the people who know their god who were called for such a time as this who are living in difficult and perilous times they shall do say do do they shall do they shall uh act out some people don't like to act out, and some people act out in wrong ways. <laughs> but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Verse 33. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. The people that know their God shall instruct people and understand. Turn to Daniel 12, verse 9. And he said, go your way, Daniel. The angel is telling Daniel to, to seal up the book, to seal up the prophecy of the last days. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Folks, we're in the time of the end. Some people say they can't understand the end times without reading their Bible because the seals were broken in the book of Revelation. Remember what it says at the end of the book of Revelation? Do not seal this book. At the end of Daniel, I'm going to go on a bunny trail. At the end of Daniel, it says seal up the book. At the end of Revelation, it says don't seal the book. You see, the people in the end days will have wisdom. They'll have understanding. And they'll know what to do. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end, till, till, till. They're opening up now. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But what does it say? But the wise will understand. Why? Because he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding for such a time as this wisdom knowledge understanding these are the things i want to impress upon your heart this morning because we need wisdom we need knowledge we need understanding of the word of god but it's for the express purpose of knowing what we ought to do knowledge puffs up but love edifies Love is doing something with the knowledge you have. Knowing what we ought to do in these times. That's why we need wisdom and knowledge and understanding. You don't have to turn there. But in First Chronicles, it talks about how the sons of Issachar had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. This is my heart for you this morning. That God would give you a heart of wisdom and prudence and understanding and knowledge in the word of God that you might know what you ought to do 
in the trials and in the circumstances and in the in the in this world system. But let's get back to Esther. Because in the very beginning of the book of Esther, in chapter 1, verse 3, this is exactly what the king did in his situation. Esther chapter 1, verse 3. Look what it says. I'm sorry, verse 13. I'm looking at verse 3, but that's not what I want. <laughs> verse 13. Esther 1, 13. You see, a situation arose at the beginning of the book of Esther. He called his former king, his former queen Vashti to come, and she wouldn't come. And then in verse 13, it says, then the king said to the wise men, look what it says. Then the king said to the wise men, who what? Understood the times. The king appealed to those who understood the times. Leaders need people of wisdom who understand the times. We need to be a people of wisdom and understanding if we would be servants in the land to bring direction and correction to the government. And here's where I want to go with some of this. One of Satan's greatest deceptions to the church in the last century has been the idea that the church needs to just and must stay out of politics. That is a lie. That is a deception. If you look over there in Esther chapter 2, we're going to pull some things out of here. Esther chapter 2, verses 21 and 23. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, that was a place of government. That was a place where the elders of the city got together to discuss and to legislate and to, and to uh, govern people. Mordecai would hang out there. Remember, he's a watchman in our, in our uh, typology. A watchman. The church had to be watchmen sitting within the gates. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gates, two of the king's eunuchs, Bichthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther. You see, the watchman is supposed to be going to the church and let them know what's going on. Do you see that? Mordecai went and told Queen Esther who's the queen, she's sitting in a place of influence, church, where are you sitting today? So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matters, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on the gallows. Again, I'll say it. So many, so often we hear voices in the church saying we have no business being involved in politics. That was a very political situation going on right there. A couple of guys were ready to go kill the king because they didn't like what was going on. We often hear voices in the church saying we have no business being involved in politics. That is so patently and unbiblically wrong. Here we have Mordecai. It's right there. We have Mordecai sitting in the gates. Okay, again, a place of government. Esther herself, a queen, sitting in a place of authority, sitting in a position to, to influence government administration and policies. If that's not political, please tell me what is. It is through her access to the king that she is able to save the Jews. It's because of her position that she is able to cause Haman, eventually, to be found out and executed. And to bring Mordecai into governmental prominence for the saving of the people. Sometimes, and you might not be too surprised by now, <laughs> sometimes I hear people tell me all the time, Brother Andy, you are too political. No, 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 no. I'm not political, I'm biblical. If you think I'm just being political, you have a grave misunderstanding of what it means to be political. The geopolitics of this world system are not merely political, they are prophetic. It's not about being political, church. It's about being biblical. It's, being, it's about being the salt of the earth, the light of a city set on a hill, and about knowing what to do for such a time as this. The Bible itself, you know, I love it when, when, when I hear, when, I don't love it actually, I'm being facetious, but when, when I hear church leaders saying, oh, oh, it, it, that issue is political, or that issue is political, the Bible is 
a book filled with politics. The word of God is a political book. If you understand that politics is simply what one's particular worldview and philosophy is. It's all politics is. You're either going to be governed by godless, despotic tyrants and wicked people, or you're going to be governed by God-fearing and righteous people. For what does the scripture say? What does the proverb says? For when the righteous are in authority, hello, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked man rules, the people groan. I want to emphasize so much in my heart. Lord, help me. I want to emphasize. I want to tell you the things that we are encountering in the world today. They're not merely political. They're eschatological. They're not political. They're eschatological. They're dealing about the end times. For those of you who may not know what the word eschatology is, it's the study of the last days. But it's because we've allowed the world to frame the narrative. We've allowed the godless and the secularists to define the terms of what politics are. We've allowed the world to hijack and obfuscate the real issues. Let me give you some examples. Does the Bible support abortion? I hope you say no. <laughs> Does the Bible support homosexuality? Does the Bible support gay marriage? But the world has deemed those things to be political issues. They're not political issues. They're biblical issues. But, but yet, little by little, little by little, the world has changed the very definitions of sexual differences. The world has changed the definition of family structure and sexuality and marital intimacy and even parenthood itself. They've all redrawn and redefined the terms because so many pulpits don't want to talk about the issues because that's political. No, it's not. Economics, taxation, those are biblical issues. But, but society thinks those are political issues. No, no, no. Let me tell you something, folks. There isn't a single thing that you could you can mention politically that the word of God hasn't addressed. That the word hasn't addressed and spoken to either directly or in precept or in principle. Not one. It's not about politics. It's about biblitics. It's not political. It's biblical. And the church has been bewitched. It's been it's been hijacked in its thinking that these biblical and cultural issues are political, but they're not, as I said. I don't, I don't want to keep hammering that. I think you get it. But homosexuality, marriage, abortion, pornography, taxes, government, crime, punishment, uh, societal issues of poverty, whatever the current political issue is, God's word has something to say about it. So we got to stop allowing the world to tell us to shut up. And we got to start admonishing church leaders to speak up. Did I get an amen? amen? Thank you. Why are so many in the church failing and falling into the trap of allowing godless forces to silence, to silence us? Under the false idea of don't mix politics and religion. That's, that's straight from the pit of hell. Don't mix politics and religion. No, well, that's because those are two things the devil doesn't want you to talk about. <laughs> Hello. If it's two things the devil doesn't want you to talk about, it's politics and religion, because he wants to control them both. So why don't we speak up? Is it fear? Oftentimes. Is it the need to avoid controversy? Most of the time. Is it the desire to be popular rather than prophetic? Uh-huh. How many here have ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian executed by Hitler. He was the, one of the heads of the confessing church, the real church in Germany. Hitler had 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 hijacked the, the, the state church, the Lutheran church in Germany. It was a state church. Hitler had hijacked it, turned it into complete Nazism. But there was a remnant of believers called the confessing church that resisted the Nazis and and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a leader of that, one of the leaders of the church. 
But he said this, to quote him. Bonhoeffer said, the church cannot remain a positive force if it continues to remove itself from the stress and strain of contemporary events. The church has a prophetic role to play in the world, not just a pastoral role. I love that quote. The church has a prophetic role to play in the world, not just a pastoral role. Remember what we read in Esther 4? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said this as well. He said, silence in the face of evil is evil. God will not hold us guiltless. That's essentially what Mordecai said to, to Esther in so many words. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Bonhoeffer paid with his life, if you know anything about him. Sadly, Hitler had him arrested, and just two weeks before the Allies defeated Germany, and freed the very camp that Bonhoeffer was held in just two weeks before that Hitler had him executed. Great man of God, but I'll, I, let me move on. Because I like that, what he said. The church of Jesus Christ is meant to be more than a soft-spoken pastoral voice in the land. We're called to be the moral and the prophetic voice to the powers and to the principalities and to the rulers of this present age, both spiritually and civilly. Speaking truth to power. I want to be, I want to say something here. We read it already. We don't have to go back and read it. But, you know, we, we, Esther said, if I perish, I perish. It's against the law, but if I perish, I perish. Because there are times we need to stand up to the governing authorities of the land and speak truth to power. But I want to be, I want to be clear about something here. I'm not advocating for, for lawless anarchy. Hello. I'm not suggesting that the church becomes a flippant, you know, just a, a flippant scoff law. That's not what I'm talking about. But there are issues that are that are greater concern and, and, and than, than what man-made laws are, man-made mores are. There are laws made by men in governments that at times go against the laws of God, like abortion and homosexuality, gay marriage, and go down the lists. And all theologians worth their salt would agree with what I'm saying. I'm going to read to you what Martin Luther King wrote from a Birmingham prison. I love this. How many here have read the entire letter from a Birmingham prison from Martin Luther King? It's, it's, it's incredible. But Martin Luther King wrote this in that letter. Again, stand, a, a man of God who was standing up for what was right ended up in prison, just like Bonhoeffer, just like Paul, just like Mordecai. When you, when, when you speak truth to power, well, if I perish, I perish. We need the boldness of the Holy Ghost. We need, we need the fire of God. Otherwise, we will just, like, go hide in the cave. But Martin Luther King said this. He said, there are two types of laws, basically what I just said, because it was a reflection of what he wrote. There are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. What is the difference between the two? An unjust law is a man-made code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Amen. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Okay, if, I, if, I, if you're telling me to stop at a stop sign because another car could come and I could hurt somebody, I'm going to obey the law to stop at a stop sign. Hello. One has a legal and moral responsibility to obey just laws. But Martin Luther King said this, conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws and i would agree with saint augustine that an unjust law is no law at all 
I am tired of hearing Christians say you got to obey the government. Romans 13, they just rip it out of context. If the government tells me I got to kill my firstborn, I'm not killing my firstborn like the Chinese government did. If the, if the government tells me I'm, I gotta, I've got to abort my second and third child, I'm not going to obey the law, just like the Chinese government did. God's laws and all legitimate laws that flow from him, I'm, I'm continuing to quote Martin Luther King, God's laws and all legitimate laws flow from him, are given for a reason. And Martin Luther King said this, and most people quote this, they only quote the first half. How many here have heard the, the Martin Luther King Jr. quote, you can't legislate morality? You've heard that, right? That's not the whole quote. He said, you can't legislate morality, but you can regulate behavior. Hello? That puts a nice big picture on it. Right. I can't change your heart, brother. If you're going to hate me, you're going to hate me. I can't change your heart. There is no law that's going to ha have me change your heart. But I can stop you from killing me. I can stop you from punching me. Well, I mean, I can't stop you, but you punch me, you're going to suffer consequences. <laughs> but you get the point. The law, he, right, Martin Luther King Jr. was absolutely right. You can't legislate morality, but you can mitigate behavior. You can regulate behavior. That's what laws do. A stop sign regulates your behavior. You're just driving down the road. Nilly willy, red lights, hello. That is what the law is for, the mitigating and regulating of man's sinful nation. Nature. Marsha, how am I doing with time? Am I beating you guys up too much? Because I got a bunch here. <laughs> laws, laws, laws. Isaiah 24, 5 says, The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Man changes the ordinances of God. Man, God says uh, he created man in his image and likeness, man and woman. Today they're saying, no, there's no such thing as, as, as gender. You could be anything you want to be. It's Not only is it sick, it's demonic. It mars the Imago Dei. It mars the image of God in man. But the earth is defiled. Our, our land is defiled because of these man-made laws. The reason the people become defiled and corrupted is because they have transgressed the laws, changed the order, it's broken the everlasting covenant. That's why God is judging the land. It comes from the spirit of Antichrist. The Antichrist himself is going to change times and seasons. I, won't, I can't get into that. But Isaiah 10.1, and I'm going to move along here says this, Isaiah 10.1 says, Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed. They legislate immorality. They legislate holocausts in the case of a Hitler. God condemns it. God says, I've raised you up to speak against it, to be, be the Martin Luther King Jr., to be the Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I have called you for such a time as this. A French philosopher by the name of Frederick Bastiat said this. He said, never confuse legal with moral. We often do that. We think, oh, it's legal. It was legal to kill Jews in Nazi Germany, too, at one time. It was, it was legal. I, don't, I, I know I don't need to say it here, but it was legal one time to own black slaves. Didn't make it right, didn't make it moral. Oh, but it was legal. Come on now. Speaking truth to power. Just because something's legal doesn't make it right or moral or righteous. Never confuse legal with moral. Just because something is legal does not make it moral. There is a, Bastiat went on to say, there is in all of us a strong disposition to believe that anything lawful is also legitimate. This belief is so widespread that many persons have erroneously held that things are just because the law makes them so. I'm going to begin to close this message with this. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And, I, and trust me, I have a lot more here, but my wife is telling me not to... Uh, <laughs> Wear out my welcome. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Because 
I really did bring this message forth to say that we are here for such a time as this, that we are in difficult times. We are in, 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 in perilous times again. And what are we looking at as we head into 2022? As some have, have humorously, humorously said that this is going to be 2022. <laughs> it seems like, I know we've, we've gone through 2020 and 2021, and we had a New Year's in 2021, now we had a New Year's in 2022. Yet it seems to me the last three years has just been one big long stuff, stuff, stuff for such a time as this. We need to walk. We need to walk in courage. We need to walk in boldness. We got to stop. We got to push back against the fear. There is nothing but fear mongering going on in the world. I'm not saying there aren't serious things going on, but we 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 are the children of God. Meditate on Psalm 91. For, for, meditate, for no evil shall come into my dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Meditate on Psalm 91, and don't just don't meditate on it. Walk in it and believe it. I can't stand the fear that's come into the church of the living God, brother. Sorry, I'm just being honest. I digress. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. For the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness, anomia in the Greek, is already at work. Now, Paul wrote this over 2,000 years ago. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Well, look how much worse it's gotten when you've got DAs all over the country who won't prosecute law. So what happens when you don't prosecute law? People rise up and they and they loot and they have smash and grabs in San Francisco and New York and, and, and Los Angeles because the DA says, well, we're not going to prosecute crime. Well, God said thou shall not steal. Well, we won't prosecute crime if it's under $950. God didn't say, to, you, thou shalt not steal unless it's under $950. <laughs> Do you know what's going on here? For the spirit of lawlessness is already at work. Only who he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the animas, the, the, the lawless one, the Antichrist. All that's going on right now in the world is being driven by the spirit of Antichrist. But a day is coming when that spirit of Antichrist is going to be manifested in Dean Antichrist. The ultimate Hitler. The ultimate Haman. The ultimate Antiochus Epiphanes. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume, thank you, Jesus, with the breadth of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. These are the days that we're living in. The spirit of Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, who's seeking to change times and seasons and laws. And we are, brothers and sisters, we are a last day's generation that God has brought forth for such a time as this. And as Mordecai said, you can choose to ignore the things and go running high. But if you do, his plan will still come to pass, but you won't be able to run and hide. So what is the answer in closing to some of these things? Well, the answer, obviously, is Jesus coming back. Hallelujah. <laughs> but until then, we got to fight the good fight of faith. I want to give you three, I guess, things that we need to work towards, I believe. Ultimately, the true answer is a true spiritual repentance. Repentance and awakening in the church. We need to return to a Judeo-Christian foundation in this nation of ours, particularly. We need to return to a Judeo-Christian foundation, and that will only happen when Christian leaders will preach the truth with boldness and moral clarity and preach the whole counsel of God. As Bonhoeffer said, we are called to be more than a pastoral ministry. We're called to be a prophetic ministry, speaking the word of God to those around us. For the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Secondly, we need to be a church that takes action, knowing what to do. As I quoted earlier, the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Father, as we pray, Father, give me ideas. Show me what to do. Father, I'm, I'm coming to you. I've been praying this for the last couple of weeks. Seriously, I've been praying this. God, I need wisdom for 2022 to know what to do, to, to, to let me, uh, give me uh, witty inventions, as somebody once called them. 
<laughs> witty ideas that breaks the mold, that gets me out of you know, from coloring inside the lines. Maybe we got to do something a little differently. Hello. And thirdly, we need to find and support people of moral courage and clarity in the voting booth. We need to vote our biblical principles, not by party, not by allegiance to some form of what society thinks we're supposed to be doing, but people of moral clarity, people who uphold and believe in this book, who believe in the word of God. That's who we need to be voting for and, and, and supporting and rising up. Hello, got quiet. You know how many Christians do not vote their biblical principles? I can go on to a whole other sermon with that, brother. Are we going to allow God to work through us? Are there no men and women of integrity left at all in the political realm? Oh, there are. But so many of them don't want to run because of what it's become. But my prayer is, as I close, and my exhortation can be just summed up this way. Let's stand together. Let's just stand together. Because this is my prayer. Let's be a people who are brought forth for such a time as this. Let us be a people of understanding of the times. Father, that's my prayer for this body here and for all those who are listening by way of the stream. Father, that we would have an understanding of the times and that you would speak to us about what we ought to do and to get involved, to get involved in different things. We are, we're not all to do the same thing. We're, we're, we're many members. We have different giftings. We have different parts of the body. But we're all to do something. Raise us up a last day's army, Father. A last day's army that brings influence, positive influence. Positive influence into the governmental realms. Whether it's local government, national government, state government. Doesn't matter. To be a people. Shining the light of your truth, filled with Holy Ghost fire to affect and to change our sphere of influence, whether it's, be, whether it's a small sphere of influence or a large sphere of influence. Let us be your people of grace, your people of mercy, your people of power, speaking the truth in love and whether we perish we perish because we know that we shall not really perish because we have eternal life in you and everyone said amen, amen and amen amen thanks for having me thanks